just quickly, I'll give you just the top notes here on Elisa. Named by Fast Company as the most influential women in technology, Elisa is a groundbreaking C-level executive and board member with experience on a global stage. Her TED Talk has received over 2.1 million views and translated into 48 languages. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you make sure and watch it. Elisa was CEO of Public Radio International from 2006 to 2018 and was the first woman and youngest CEO to head a major public radio network. She envisioned and orchestrated PRI's 2018 merger with PRX, the first ever network merger in public media, and became executive chairman of PRI PRX from 2018 to 2019. She is currently the CEO of an early stage AI company focused on communications, and she is going to give us some more information about that today. So without further ado, take it away, Elisa. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I uh, hope that this, this, this talk is interesting. And I, for me, my favorite parts of doing these things is actually is the Q&A section. I think sometimes the most interesting things come out. Um, there's a lot that I can cover. And so it's always an interesting, um, an interesting balance of trying to figure out what to put in and what to do as a part of the conversation in Q&A. So please, Please do think of questions and thoughts that you have along the way, and um, I'm really looking forward to that, that piece of, the, of our conversation together today. So I'm going to be sharing some slides um, in part just to help move forward in the conversation, and of course, when, when I'm done, I'll come back. I'll come back and you'll get to see my beautiful background here of stuff, boxes back there. Um, all right, so here we go. I'm just going to get to the sh shared screen thing here. Okay, so as, you, as Marta said, not long ago, we were all together and we were um, meeting in New York and talking a lot about women in media was part of the topic of that conversation um, and, you know, what it meant to be a leader in this world. And I think that this is a follow on to that conversation. Specifically, what I'm going to be doing is sharing a perspective that I've developed over a number of years, but also um, have been diving deep more recently in some research that I'd like to share with you, at least a top line, um, and give you a teaser for a study that we're going to be releasing as well that we will provide to all of you, um, specifically about COVID-19 and communicating um, in, in, in a world of COVID. Um, but the bottom line is this talk is about how we are all challenged to communicate in a polarized world as leaders and as women. And COVID-19 itself has layered this in, in a way that is truly unprecedented. Um, and so much polarization has been growing in our society and around the world over a number of years. But I think COVID-19 itself and our experience with it has really laid bare um, the impact of what um, polarization can do when we're trying to communicate about something that's literally affecting and impacting all of our lives. And as leaders, how, how do we think about communicating in this environment? So, let's do this. Sure, whoops, yep, okay. So here's just some information about me if you have questions or wanna follow up with me afterwards, um, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so our goal, um, today, my talk goal is to share insights on how communications must change now to effectively connect across divides with, pe with people at scale. And it really is a leadership challenge and it happens one leader uh, at a time. Uh, I often share a lot of stats, but the purpose today is to get us thinking and take away some big ideas. So I will be sprinkling a little bit of this, um, a little bit of stats here and there because I love the numbers, but this is about the big ideas. And in essence, what um, my work has been about is how do we seek pluralistic audiences? How do we create one conversation when we have people with very different worldviews that we're all interacting with? Also in a very hyper niche world where people are used to getting into their niches and staying there. And how do we kind of 
pull up and are able to relate to people across these niches. So a lot of my work is around what does the new pluralism look like? And it might seem crazy to say, but given all the ways that we communi can communicate now, and I'm gonna go into a little bit of the scale of that, so this will be like my one statty slide here. Um, I believe and I contend that we are in our infancy in how we actually relate and communicate with each other through technology and through communications. Even though all these ways exist that we are communicating and consuming media and it's challenging, but opportunities also exist. So just some grounding and this is the scale of the billions and millions that we are all interacting with. And for those of us who've been around a little while, like think about 15 to 20 years ago and how almost nothing on this list existed. <laughs> um, so this idea, you know, 5 billion videos are watched or 4 billion texts or more are sent every day. Um, 300 billion emails. I feel like I'm getting most of those. Uh, and, you know, 150 million hours of Netflix videos or 100 million photos uploaded to Instagram. This is an, a, a daily stat, the one that I saw that I think really gives a sense of both the expression as well as how we're using technology. Is there is, and this is and counting, 4.7 trillion pictures or photographs that are being stored today that have been uploaded by people. So it gives you a sense of this notion of the fragmentation, the scale, but also the fragmentation of media and how we consume uh, both media and how we're communicating. And what that's done is what I call created the fragmentation or polarization paradox, where we have these two poles that we're living in kind of simultaneously, and it creates a lot of tension in how we communicate um, and also potential opportunity. So on the one hand, we have these filter bubbles, right? We can find our tribe, our people, who we want to be communicating with. And uh, and who we feel most comfortable with. And yet, because of all of this uh, exposure and, and ways to reach all different kinds of people, we have completely new potential streams of interactions that we would not have had 10 years ago as well. So on the one hand, we're in our little world. And on the other hand, we can be, and in many cases are exposed to things that we never would have been able to find before. And related to this is this idea that you know, people feel more alone than ever, isolated certainly in an environment of COVID than ever, and yet we're together. Um, there are, again, ways that we can find our relatives, find our friends, find new friends, and interact with them online in ways that we never had before. There are friendships, I, I imagine you have these two of people that I get to interact with who I've met online, I will probably never know in person, and they are still close to me. This idea of blurred, blurred lines of the public versus private communication, right? Everybody's putting a lot out there. Is that public? Is it private? Um, those boots that follow you around the internet after you looked at them, <laughs> wanting you to buy them. Um, on the one hand, you don't like this idea that people know a lot about you and these systems know a lot about you. And on the other hand, you actually might really like those boots, right? So it's, it's not as simple as I like it or I don't. We kind of like both. And those things are often in conflict with each other. As leaders of different kinds of businesses, which is a big part of what this talk is about, um, you know, we are all interacting in this world as a customer, as a consumer, but also as a leader of this notion of I have a stake, consumer expectations, right? Versus the frustration that we have that we may not always get those met. And of course, on the flip side, you have that from companies, right? Who are trying to figure out how to relate to their customers in ways and their expectations, which are far more immediate and far more um, driven by all different kinds of considerations that a company maybe five to 10 years ago didn't even have to think about, particularly when we talk about a values orientation, which I will be getting to in just a moment. So we have these old and new definitions of tribes, identity, and geography in the way that we approach our lives. And 
We have new relationships with brands um, in terms of our expectations that they're accountable to me, and yet we have some of the lowest trust in all kinds of institutions and brands that we've ever seen. So this paradox is playing out when we think about communications from a big standpoint, uh, from, a, from a broader standpoint. So this was a graphic that um, when I gave a talk earlier this year to Sparks and Honey, um, which is a, a firm that I'm associated with, who's also, I believe, part of um, the initiative, um, is they, they put this out, and I thought that this was really interesting, and so I've continued to use it. And they, they said, and I think it's quite appropriate, that today we have a modern-day Tower of Babel, where effective communication requires a greater perception, skills, and tools than just the medium and message. And then I would add, like never before. And, you know, I, I think I, I don't love generalizations, but I will say this, that I think women are generally better well attuned to these kinds of considerations. And it's a good thing because in this environment, our ability to lead is going to be more important than ever. So when we step back, part of what I'm looking at, and we'll address this also in the era of COVID, is what is the rise of the values-based consumer. This has been documented by Forrester, Accenture, and others. Um, and we can also see examples in our life here with Kaepernick as an example, where as Forrester noted in a recent report, and I thought that this was kind of apocalyptic way of saying it, but I think it's really true, which is, quote, to survive customers' volatile values reckoning, marketers, and I would argue leaders, must create context for, the con for their consumers to make values-based decisions. It's not just a thing that's kind of happening. It is a thing that is literally has taken over our economy and the way that I believe our markets and our interactions are working. So it's not only values-based consumer, it's the values-based citizen, which we would think about this in political context, but it's actually washing across everything. It's the rise of the values-based person. When we look at this, over 50% of online consumers and more than 70% of millennials use a values-based lens to decide whether they are going to associate with a particular brand. And of course, in a COVID-19 era, which we are all living through right now, the largest health crisis of our lifetime, we can see that our responses collectively have been driven by our values lens and our worldviews. What we think about it, how we're going to act on it, what we will do, how we think our children should be, where our parents should live, um, how much we're interacting with people, whether we're wearing masks, whether we're um, you know, all these pieces are coming into play, and it has to do with this very powerful worldview. When we think about this in the context of business, it's everything from what actually is business success itself. Um, so when we talk about both shareholder value this idea of conscious capitalism or something that the conference board has been um, quite behind. And as you all are, probably know, the conference board is an organization where some of the largest corporations in the world um, are a part of it and consider it sort of a leadership um, organization. The idea of total impact valuation, where a company is not only responsible for shareholder value, but for the economic, environmental, and societal impacts. And this is because of the rise of the values-based consumer. We've talked a bit about the nature of our identities to the relate and our relationship with brands, our ability to effectively connect or not with each other. Um, you know, the classic what's happening at Thanksgiving dinner tables, but also friends unfriending, you know, each other because of different political views and not being able to figure out for a variety of reasons how to bridge that. Um, uh, it relates to all of our purchase decision-making. Again, who we want to associate with and buy from. 
and even the definition of what a good place to work is and what is the value, um, what are, what is the values kind of or worldview perspective of that organization. And of course, now all of this is happening. All of those things are happening pre COVID. And now COVID is basically a new lens to look at all of these again. Um, and that layer of sort of not only complexity, but of a huge event that is affecting all of us that affects how we're making our decisions. So it's kind of like what I talked about when in this environment, whether we're making a decision to wear a mask or whether you're deciding what company you're going to purchase from or what group you're going to join or who you opt into and endorse, it's almost as if we are a NASCAR of brands as we walk around. And in this environment, that is almost that is the norm we're constantly showing those sort of badges of who we are to different people and ultimately the organizations and the companies that we choose to associate with will be sort of on our will be one of those badges or won't so this has led to some real urgent realities um, unprecedented fragmentation and polarization is everywhere companies um, particularly the larger companies, although it's happening across the board, can no longer stay neutral. Um, this again is from the conference board. 73% of large companies are under considerable pressure to weigh in on social issues while customers and employees, by customers, employees, and shareholders. Um, one in five customers will walk away forever if a company's values don't align with their own. So it's in this environment where completely new communication paradigms are needed. So we're not going back. So what does the new forward look like? The first piece of this is to understand when I talk about values, what am I speaking about? And um, how does that relate to this conversation? When I talk about values, I talk about the universal pr uh, principles you use to make decisions. And I'm gonna show a graphic of this in just a second. One of these examples, this is well-documented within behavioral science. Um, but the way to think about it is, it's like the 23andMe of values. We all have a mix of values and they are based on these same universal principles. If the question is, is what order do you rank them and how much are you weighting them? But we all have some mix of this same makeup, right? And it's just how, how, how is your mix different than someone else's? And ultimately what we find, which is not surprising, is people with similar values mixes tend to relate um, and congregate with one another. So this is an example of one of these, um, one of these values wheels, as it were. Um, this happens to be one from uh, a researcher uh, named Shalom Schwartz, who has vetted this model in over 50 countries around the world. And one of the things that I find really fascinating about, so you can see the 10 values, self-direction, stimulation, hedonism, conformity, security, power, et cetera. One of the things I find interesting about this particular model um, and why I like it is that it's in this wheel and it all too shows the paradox, right? One of the things that's really important about this is to understand that we often within our same selves, right, have conflicting values at the same time. And in fact, that's normal. So I may care about security, particularly in this environment, for COVID, but I also am a person that generally holds dear to self-direction and my ability to be independent, right? And you can have both of those things happening at the same time. Or I might be very focused on achievement, I'm very ambitious and I want to be successful and influential, but I'm also somebody who cares deeply about equality or social justice and aspects of universalism. So these, these are dynamic and it's a part of that, that wheel. And, and one of the things that when I look at something like this, I'm actually quite hopeful because I think so much of our dialogue and actually how we think about reaching across divides is we tend to think of it solely as a left-right divide, which is simple, so that's the good news about it. But 
what it also does is it limits ways of actually reaching and engaging with people because it puts people in two different camps that seem very, um, yeah, very, very specific and limiting. And in fact, people are across multiple camps and are multiple things at once. So the complexity for me actually is makes it far more hopeful. So when we talk about values, we describe them as the values graph. And here's the way we think about it. And this is kind of um, uh, the way I look at this is it's kind of like uh, the kindergarten of marketing history. So here we go. Um, first, there was nothing. Then there was demographics. Then there were psychographics. So these are the things like attitudinally, where are people coming from on different things? Then there was sentiment, which is how do I feel about it? Do I like it? Do I not like it? What's the sentiment around X company or this particular topic or issue? And then you have the values graph. And the values graph is the why. Why do I feel the way that I do? right? I could cut across different psychographic profiles with the same values graph and also times across different demographic groups as well. So it gets at this notion of why you feel what you do and why you do what you do. Um, and so the values graph does underlie everything and it impacts as a leader who you reach, what you say, ultimately what actions you take, and what you feel most connected to. So both for you as a leader and who you're relating to. And again, we care about many of the same things as, as people. We care about our health, that our families um, are, are healthy and we, we live in a place that's safe, that we ha can drink our water, we can uh, we, we wish to pursue education, um, the natural world is important, the equality of people. These are many things that many of us agree on. But we can get lost in our own bubbles when we talk about and try to relate to other people on these topics and things that we care about. So, when I think about the future of communications, again, it's no longer just message and medium. And it's about that what we're trying to do is to build trust which has been decimated, and it's very important to build it both as leaders and uh, as a part of uh, our organization, and that loyalty is ultimately driven by long-term connection. So again, it's kind of like the, um, the uh, paint by numbers, uh, kindergarten, everything I knew in kindergarten. The first thing is to understand where people are coming from and respecting their worldview and meeting them where they are. Um, and ultimately, that can be difficult in this environment, but recognizing that there are often strands of agreement underneath what can seem like disagreement. And a lot of times what we have seen is that the words literally get in the way in terms of that translation. So things are lost in translation. I'm not trying to downplay that there are true disagreements that we have about solving specific problems or the ways that we view the world or what's possible. But I'm also arguing that there's so much more common ground that is available to us if we're looking for it and respect the fact that it's there and that others may have very similar cares and desires and needs as wants as I do. And then being able to establish that dialogue between you, your team or your company and its customers to translate your brand and your values and into their world and back again so that it's much more of a, a virtuous loop. So this leads me to some of the research that we've been doing that I wanted to share with you, which is we've, we've looked at this at an individual word level, and I'll get into the methodology in just a second. Um, but every day, what we know is that our values drive our decisions and how we respond to words and images. And we know that words and images connect with people based on their values. We've analyzed over 20 million words um, looking at consumer language, and we can see a number of things. Um, one is that the language is dynamic. Two is that there are multiple values languages in the United States. And basically the way to think of it is it's like powerful analogies, how Different people relate to or talk about the same things, but using different words to talk about those things. 
And, it, and the fact is, is that every word you choose, or almost every word you choose, connotes a value system, whether you recognize it or not. When we look at this statistically speaking and when we use um, deep data analysis to look at the values languages that are literally operating right now in the United States. So part of what I'm here to say is that every word counts and that you have to recognize as the most open-minded and leadership-oriented person that you can be, that you are in your own bubble. And when you are communicating with people, you are using a values language or a set of values languages without, under, without necessarily knowing it. And what I'm hoping to do is to help kind of peel back that reality for you now and give you some, some thoughts on how to uncover how that's happening um, in your life and you know, ultimately uh, in your professional life and give you some suggestions on ways that you might be able to bridge that gap so that you don't get things lost in translation or lose people um, based upon the words that you are, are, are not choosing. So I'm gonna use a really simple example, and it's much more complex than this, but I'll just say it here, that depending on who you are, let's say that you're an organization that requires people to give you money, right, in order to do your work. Whether, how you respond to the word donate versus give versus pledge versus support, sustain, et cetera, et cetera, depends on the values group or the values enclave that you are in, and ultimately, each of these words has slightly different um, impact and appeal depending on which values enclave you are in. So again, it's expressing the same idea, but you literally have these different words that relate more deeply to one group or another. Now, this is not to say that if you could say give to a donate person, that they're going to be offended by the fact that you did that. Of course, they're not. But uh, what it will do is you're more likely to get a response and engagement if you say give to a give person, right? Or you understand across your, your organization that give and donate work the most broadly, whereas pledge does not. These are the kinds of things, um, and that's just at an individual word level. Imagine now that almost every word that you use has this similar quality. And that's what we see um, in our research. So some top line recommendations that I would have um, is that in this environment where words really matter, is to demonstrate values in every communication and touch point you have, or you will compete on the lowest common denominator and you will not build loyalty. So think about what is the values that my organization stands for and how in every communication am I expressing them or at least tipping my hat to them? And never to lose that opportunity because if you're not testing and forwarding that notion in every communication, you're not learning, which allows you to build on it every, in every communication. Um, so, and it, I'm telling you, when you have this uh, change in sort of the, your mental model and the way that you approach your work, you'll see all these opportunities to be expressing it that may not have been as obvious to you before sort of this realization. Understand your values in relationship to your competition or risk becoming irrelevant. When we have figures of 50 to 75% of the purchasing public, at least if we're talking about sort of in a business or organizational standpoint, using the values lens as a deep way of deciding whether they are going to relate to you or not, Obviously, the actions that your organization take is super important, um, but the way that you talk about the actions that you take is almost as equally as important. Third, and, or fourth, I guess, yeah, third. Third, beware of false positives. What I mean by that is, and this goes back to sort of this notion of what we think we know versus what we really know. So the system that's set up now um, often uh, encourages us to quote unquote optimize our communications. And so we might have a marketing campaign or a particular communication that goes out that we get a fabulous response on. And we're excited about it. And you should be. And then the second question to ask yourself is, is this just a 
a deep response from one segment of the value segment that live in my customer base. Because you might be, by optimizing, you may actually be optimizing to only one segment of the people that you need to reach as a part of a pluralistic communication. Um, and so don't, don't necessarily say, oh, that must be the way we should do them all from now on, because you may be missing important people that you want to be connecting with. Um, understand that if you express your values in the same way every time, it likely creates barriers to building common ground with your stakeholders. This can be a difficult one because I know um, for at least some organizations, there's a lot of time and effort around saying something in an exact and specific way. And it's not to say that that can't be a dominant way that you say it, but it's also important to come up with analogous ways to talk about the values that are important to your organization for this very reason that now pluralistic communication requires it. And finding those ways to express important ideas and values, um, low risk if possible ways so that you can learn and get that feedback loop that can be helpful. So I will, I will end shortly, but I wanted to stop uh, to conclude by saying that this environment is challenging for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, you know, our world is experiencing one of the most devastating kind of health and now economic, as well, economic crises. And we're all living through huge changes in our life. At the same time, I'm also hopeful because I think this idea of the values driven consumer that has developed over the last five years in particular is so fundamentally good and it's a powerful trend. And to treat this communications landscape um, like an opportunity because when you have people who are literally spending and deciding what they do based upon this values lens, it means that we are able to move things forward in ways, perhaps in some cases outside of a political context, that can help our, you know, our organizations thrive, our, community, our communities thrive, and actually be that bridge that allows to bring people together. Um, in other words, the economic and bridging and pluralism is, is intersecting in a really powerful way. Um, it's not that it's separate anymore and there's the things that we do for good and then there's the economics. It's all coming together and this is in part being driven by millennials, but other generations are right behind in terms of their importance that they put on this. The second is, is that it also suggests that the outrage machine that we're all kind of sucked into um, and that we're living through, um, and by the way, a lot of people make money off of the outrage machine. Let's not forget that. Um, but there, there's a counter trend that people are looking for common ground and for organizations and leaders that can find it and take the thoughtful approach to make that happen. There is great opportunity, not only for you and your organization, but it makes the world a better place. We can find common ground. Not every word needs to be an ignition point. And by experimenting and trying different things, we can, we can help do that in the language that we use. It's not simple left, right. There are many ways to relate to people. So listen and learn and be vigilant about and think about this notion of values graph is a great start. And treat this new communications landscape like an opportunity to build authenticity, that deep value, resilience and loyalty for your customers, your employees, your shareholders, your family, and, and for broader society. So that's just a quick flyover. I know that there will probably be, uh, hopefully, um, lots of questions. And um, that's, that's kind of a perspective that I've built um, based on working in public media in the past in terms of reaching pluralistic audiences at the same time and trying to figure out these models where um, maybe the rest of the world was more focused on niche. And, um, and also now kind of combining that with the power of technology and data science in ways that have never been done before and completely new applications that haven't been thought about before. So 
I'm hopeful that this can be helpful to you and I'm excited to hear what questions you may have. Thank you so very much, Elisa. Um, I have a question already. Uh, and please, anyone that has questions, go ahead and add them to the group chat and then I'll present them one at a time to Elisa. Andrea is asking, speaking of being hopeful, as a result of the time we are in, do you see more opportunity for women-led, women-owned companies going forward because women tend to lead from a place of values? Well, certainly, I think that, you know, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this because um, the company that I'm starting, we're at seed stage, which is the earliest stage that you can be at. So, you know, doing a startup in the middle of a pandemic is an interesting thing, um, to say the least. Uh, but I think uh, one of the things that happens in times of crisis and particularly because of this values lens that's over everything. I think that women, because of our ingenuity and because of the fact that we can often see things, um, problems, we're pragmatic about fixing them, but we can also have uh, incredible vision, there's real, there's real opportunity. And certainly it's not for the faint of heart, um, whether you're a startup or you're running a large corporation in this environment, but I think the way that we can be attuned, um, not only because of what we can see because of our own understanding of a values-based environment, um, but because of the opportunities that we can see to fix things in ways that may not have been possible before. In, in the shock, like we're living through right now, pretty much everything is being rethought, which is scary, by the way, but on that flip side, it means everything is being rethought. So conventions of ways of doing things are changing. And maybe you have an idea or your company can shift and do things in a different way than wasn't possible before. So I think, I think there is real opportunity. Um, and of course, as we know as women, it's not easy for us to do it um, for a variety of structural reasons. But um, it also means that times of uncertainty like this, some of the biggest companies and the biggest ideas take flight because of this, because of the disruption. Okay, um, we have more questions coming in, Elisa, thank you. Um, from Kathy Ball, how do you view the ability to influence through analytics? Let's see, Kathy, did I capture all of that? Yes. Um, so I, so what's fascinating about some of this work that we've been doing, I can only speak to my, my little world on this, but I've, just to give you background, I've always been kind of a numbers, I've always been a bit of a geek. I, I believe in data and, um, you know, just from the youngest age, I was fascinated by math and stuff. So fast forward to what we're doing and the name of my company, um, my fledgling company is called Pluralytics. Um, what I found the most interesting is what the data tells you, what the, what the scientific testing tells you. And oftentimes when we're talking about relating to potentially with groups and people who have a different values mix than we do, it's completely counterintuitive what the correct answer is. So this idea of really questioning yourself in a good way where it's like, oh, and I'll just use the give versus donate example because it's easy. Um, but it's sort of that I just really think give sounds good here. Like, I just think that really sounds like, the, and then the, the system is saying, no, it, it's really, it's donate, it's donate or it's sustain, it's sustain. You're like, God, but the pros, it just sounds so much better when I do it this and, and what we found in our testing, and this is where this idea of, of trying different things is so important, is nine times out of 10, at least in our case, when we've used the data, the data is right and I am wrong. Particularly when I'm trying to relate to a different group of people that 
may have a, a different profile than I do. I'm not right. And um, I can't, I was actually trying to look this up last night and I couldn't find it, but there is a, a name in psychology about this where what you do, and this is where the filter bubbles also really feed this, right? Where you, you construct this world around you, you have this reality of who you are, and you project that everyone, a lot of people must be just like you, right? Must kind of think the same thing about, you know, perhaps this particular politician or this particular issue or this particular product, and you kind of construct all of this. Um, but in fact, you're probably quite different than what most other people are thinking. The way you think about where you are on the bell curve of a distribution, right? You're kind of thinking, you must be kind of in the middle, or maybe I'm right here, but in fact, you're probably not that similar to other people. And that is part of the kind of construct that I think many people put into their head, and then they don't understand why then it's getting lost in translation. And the only way that you can see those sorts of things is to look at data. Because it, it, it and, and then to truly listen to the data um, so that you can see that, oh, you know, in fact, what I thought isn't actually the case and I need to take this new information into account. I hope that's answering your question. Okay, yes, thank you. From Dara Lamb, can you speak more about the counter trend to the outreach machine? PRA, PRI was a great example, by the way. Any deeper research on this, numbers, demos? How is it being manifested? And any other thoughts on what we will see in the future? Such a great question. Um, you know, I think it's, so I think we can see the transcendent beyond the outrage machine when you see, and I'll just use some social media examples. I know I don't think that this is truly always the case, but certainly in social media, but there are examples where people coalesce around a particular story or idea, and you can tell that it's kind of cross-segment. cross, cross segment. You know, it, it seems to be appealing across different kinds of people, and they're feeling connection. They're feeling connection to it. And oftentimes, that's because it's a kind of higher order sort of idea that it kind of gets to those bigger ideas that we all, that we all care about. But to your point, I actually think that, and this is part of this infancy thing, um, what we can tell from the data is that there is actually a lot more common ground. But what's happening when we look at marketing and media and communication is that the system has really been set up for hyper-segmentation, differentiation, fragmentation, and ultimately, this filter, fil filter bubbles and what I would argue is also divisiveness that kind of gets fed because you're constantly being told you're exactly right, you know, when you're kind of in this, in these bubbles. So I think it's an example of kind of an insight that can lead to all kinds of new businesses and approaches to how we're communicating. At least that's the way I look at it because that's where I come from. But in terms of my mental models and what I'm good at. But I think that this notion that we have more in common than we think we do could have a lot of um, broader implications to all kinds of businesses. Um, and I think that it's that thing that's getting disrupted. You know, right now we can see the divisiveness because of COVID-19, but and also in some of the research that we did, we also found a lot of common ground in it that's not part of the conversation. And my God, it's one of the most important things that's happening in our world right now. And yet that seems to be getting lost. There is both opportunity in that, of course, and we also just wanna solve it because it's a terrible thing that's happening. So I would argue that um, public media has been an example, although you know, public media has not always been perfect at this either. Um, it was certainly a goal. Um, a lot of broader brands are often confronted with doing this as well. The more broad, the larger your brand is, the more likely you have people of different value segments who are important to you, not just one. And so that's why I look at the, the kind of, it might seem counterintuitive, but the corporate structure 
is something that's actually quite positive in this environment to build the bridges because we're not necessarily seeing it in a political context. I think I can say that without being highly partisan. I mean, it's not kind of pretty obvious. <laughs> There's some pretty deep divides out there. And so where will the leadership take place that will allow that to happen? And I think it will happen kind of bottom up and through um, business and corporate structure is actually where, um, where some of this will come together in part because the money Go back to that piece. The money is also incenting figuring this out when we talk about um, the business world. And so that's a really important alignment, I think, um, as, as we move forward. Another question that we have from Ann Groves in London. The values graph with those characteristics is a great tool to use for analyzing internal and external audiences. Have you used it in communications planning to analyze your audience's likely values profile? Yeah, so we've done some testing um, with, we did a test with a large um, Fortune 500 in communications last fall. And uh, it kind of had a number of things. Part of it was that we, we looked at the language that they were using to talk about some specific products that they were going to launch. We gave them a, um, an assessment to say, well, this is, you know, it's fine language. Um, you should know that you're appealing to one specific group based upon a couple of groups that you might actually be trying to reach. And then we gave them um, some recommendations on how to talk about the same thing. So this wasn't about changing who they were or what they were trying to do with the product. It was helping them to understand, well, but if you just say it, you know, think about it as a very powerful syn synonym engine. If you say it this way, um, you will actually have more of a response. So we can predict how well you will respond, you know, based upon how well your target, your targets will respond um, based upon our values, languages, research. And they, we did a test with them where we tweaked the language um, and then we helped them target. Um, in this case, we targeted on Facebook. Um, so, you know, they, they were reaching this group of people and then we helped them understand which groups of people within the group of people that they were already trying to reach would have some of these different, different qualities or uh, potential values um, segmentation. And they're, their click in this case click through rate although this isn't an advertising tool per se but their click through rate went up over a hundred percent so we predicted that the language would work better with different kinds of groups and we were correct um, so that's an example of us sort of aligning both what you were saying with how you were saying you know what you care about so it wasn't about changing what they cared about it was how did they express what they cared about in different ways to different kinds of people. One of the things that we've also done recently, and this is this will be in the COVID report that we'll provide to you guys as soon as it's out, that's free, we'll you know, make sure that you get it if you're interested, um, that we're really interested in as well, is it's not just about saying it this way, give versus donate, right? It's also maybe support is a word that actually works for both. And we talk about that as a common ground word. And in, the, in COVID, part of our focus was because we were seeing all of the polarization and then we could show how polarized it was based on words. Um, we could also show what was possible from a common ground standpoint. And that's really powerful too, because those are like unity words in a way, it's kind of a way of thinking about them. So instead of igniting the polls, how do we kind of bolster uh, bolster the common the common ground um, and all of that is led by you know is led by data and analysis but the but I think intuitively as people as leaders we also understand this and that's why saying things in different ways is so important when you're trying to express the same meaning because you're more likely to kind of bring the different groups along as you're speaking about as you're speaking about um, the idea or the important topic that you're trying to express. We have 
two time for these two final questions and I, I think that we're just running out of time there's so much fascinating information here one question that's been asked by two people um, from Barb Jump I love data too your values graph is all about emotion though data keeps your messages safe but we're in a time when people crave fearlessness and emotional connections how do you decide which you rely on more to choose your messaging, your words, data or emotion? Okay, so this is really interesting. So um, I would actually say that what I'm trying to do is, when we talk about the values graph, it's true that emotion is a part of what is a result of values, but in a way, the, that, the way I look at the values graph is it's one order of magnitude deeper, right? So it's kind of more, it relates to like a deeper sense of sort of purpose and how you make decisions versus specifically that made me angry or that made me happy, right? So it has kind of that, that, that kind of deeper orientation. So when we use the data to think about, in this case, words, right? Um, or ideas, we're really trying to get to that deeper meta, that deeper meta level. So the data is actually helping us to make that values connection. It's not the data or the values connection. It's both. And it's trying to actually achieve it. That, that's what I'm trying, that's what we're trying to use the data to find. Um, because we can't necessarily cut, trust our gut instincts. You know, one of the things that happens with a lot of companies is that they do think deeply about their values and what they're trying to be. And then they don't have a scientific or empirical way to get at if that values alignment is happening. So there's different ways to deal with that as leaders or as a company, you set up structures to help you do that through methodologies that you develop on your own or you you know, acquire or have consultants or use tools and things to help you get at it. And this is a way of getting at that, at least it's a methodology that that I've developed and that we've developed to to try to to try to get at it. But it's actually trying to achieve to use the data to help you understand that so that you're able to make that connection. I'll just I'll just end with this note that I think the most respectful thing that we can do when we're relating to one another is to understand where someone's coming from and the way that they relate to the world, talk about the world, et cetera, is critical to that. So it's one of the most respectful things we can do is to take that journey and make, make that connection. So it's kind of like when you travel to a foreign country and you literally learn, quote unquote, a new language so that you can kind of communicate and you can show that you care you cared enough to know how to say hello and where's the bathroom or whatever right and thank you right um this is kind of like that really it's we we get so caught up in where we're coming from we think that we actually might be be making that connection or, or showing that respect but this takes it to another level and because of the way the human brain works it's in that totality of how we're communicating that we may or may not be sending the signal and we might be getting lost in translation because it literally it's like you're not speaking someone else's language that you're trying to relate to i think we we have more questions but i'm afraid we're running out of time so um i think that what we will do is um i will cut over to meg sullivan quorum's founder to to close us up this fascinating hour. So Meg. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Elisa, thank you so much for coming back and spending time with us. We, we are so utterly appreciative. Um, it's such a fascinating topic, I think, around communications and connecting, which are the two things you're, you're talking about here. And I think often about it as a, if I I think about it as a leader, you really helped me today crystallize some things that I need to consider as I'm connecting with my communities and trying to create change in my own organization. You know, how do I do that effectively? But it also made me think a lot about what's next sort of for the women's movement here, which is really interesting and quorum 
is a part of all of this, trying to think about this, how do we create the change we wanna see? So the first step is, is how do we do better job of, of the bridge connecting, the, connecting with each other around the critical things we all care about so that we can get, we can get interconnectedness um, to create change? And then how do we involve others who are critical in the decision-making process to understand, feel, and imagine our world and what that looks like and help them help us. You know, so that's what came up for me consistently as I was thinking about all that you were talking about and putting on the lens of quorum for that. So thank you so much for such a rich um, discussion today. Um, and I hope everyone else really enjoyed it. I wanted to just mention a few things about quorum before we, we wrap up here. Um, which is we have a lot of upcoming um, virtual events that I just wanted everyone to be aware of. We have a, a, a whole um, session on virtual networking and how to connect virtually effectively. So um, I think that should be really fun with Dina Bakowitz. And that's on the 12th of May at 6.30 um, Eastern Standard Time. We also have a, a virtual evening social uh, for members that's being led by Lynn Murphy Rivera, Deborah DeSantis and Gertrude is um, our Shakar. And our last social was a, was a blast. So I'll just tell you, you know, it's not to be missed. Um, and that is happening on May 20th at 6.30. And then the one other thing I'll mention because Diane will be in contact with everybody about other um, content that's up and coming is on June 10th, we have a whole session focused on the emotional impacts of financial turmoil. And I think the notion of talking about money right now and financial security and how do we think about money and what do we do with our money and, and all that kind of stuff is a fascinating topic in, t in today's moment um, in time. It's, it's important in general, but I think it's even more important right now. And Maggie Kulik is gonna be um, spearheading that conversation and she's gonna do a two-part series for us, which I think will be absolutely terrific. So I hope you'll all be able to join us. Um, last thing I wanted to mention is um, because we are now operating in this virtual world, the last time we were actually physically together with Elisa Miller, which was so amazing, but now we are all um, coming from all over the place virtually. Quorum has moved to a complete virtual platform and um, we want to offer anyone who is not a member to join us as a digital member because that's where we're at at this moment. Um, get connected with this amazing community of women and um, you know, take advantage of the incredible content that the organization is creating as we think about how we continue to evolve and create change for women. So. That's it for me. It's so great to see so many fabulous faces. I miss all of you so much. I hope you're all well. And Alisa, thanks again. And um, yes. last words? I just, I just, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. I remember being together and feeling the energy of this wonderful group of people and for your leadership and, in, in, you know, helping lead and make this all happen. It's an amazing thing. Um, and it's groups like this that help us get through these hard times. Um, and I just would also just make an offer that if there's anyone on this call who's interested in learning more or would like to, to beta or learn more about the research that we're doing, we're looking for people who are innovators who would like to, to engage with us. So um, I put my email in the comments. Um, and um, again, we'll send the study to you all. And if there's anything I can do to be helpful, um, I'm happy to do so. And if you're interested in testing and being a part of what we're doing and learning more, um, I would love to, love to have you. Ah, that's so awesome. Thank you, Elisa. I'm sure everyone is as appreciative of I, as I am of that offer. So um, I'm, I have a feeling you might hear from a few of us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, it's so great to see everybody. Um, please be well and safe and look forward to seeing you next time we all get together. Be well. Thank you all.